I'll start by saying that she is a postdoc researcher um, here at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. She's also happens to be one of my supervisors. She also works for a quantum software company based in, in Canada called Xanadu. And despite the fact that she couldn't calculate the tip on our bill last night, she's, she's one of the smartest and most intelligent and most humble people that I know, Dr. Maria Schultz. <laughs> I was scared of that. Okay, so um, yes, um, I was bullied by my co-organizers to give a talk, but I'm actually really happy about that because I suffer from what Benji was referring to in the panel discussion, which is that I'm giving talks everywhere in the world, but never in South Africa. And one of the reasons is that I'm actually not too sure if what I do or what we do here is of interest to you. But actually now I'm starting to think maybe it is because I've got a couple of like questions and see that some people are also in for the a bit more crazy stuff. So not just like good old fashioned machine learning. And um, this is about that. So lean back and um, yeah, now for something very different. Machine learning with quantum computers. So what's the next big thing in machine learning? You can give different answers but we didn't hear anything about actually changing the hardware compute completely. So basically like putting in a computational system that follows different laws of physics. What actually happens if we take away the very basic with which machine learning was developed? And that's a, a really fascinating question that, um, well, haunts me since maybe eight years now, or seven years. Um, how do I click further here? Is this set up here? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, Perfect. So, um, but to say at the beginning, should you really care about it if you are in machine learning? So sometimes on conferences, I get this question, so do I actually have to know about this if I want to be like relevant in five years time or something? And you might see more and more of these uh, articles here, like here from Singularity Hub, I think it was from last month, finally, prove that quantum computing can boost machine learning. So the simple answer to this is no. If you just want to stay relevant in five years, then do whatever, but maybe this is not the route to go. If you're, however, interested in like what might happen in 30 years, in 20 years, or if you just want to change your anger completely, then come on board here. By the way, this title and the article, so the, the, the journalist who wrote the article, she's a very Sally, uh, Sally fan, she's a very cool journalist, and then the editor came and she told me afterwards and like put this title over her article, and she sent me an email to apologize for this personally. So yeah, so this is how it goes sometimes. So what I do, I go, um, since I, I know that sometimes people who are in quantum computing and who work actually in quantum theory often are interested in completely different things than the audience, we do compromise. So I just like continue speaking. I'll go like more and more into focus on like what we are actually doing here from like starting from very broad. Interrupt me with questions if you want, but I hope I stop quite early so I won't use the whole time and then you can actually ask questions. So I think that's, that's the best approach. But let's start with quantum computing. I have tried many ways of introducing this in 15 minutes and I think it's quite an offense to try and introduce something that took you a couple of years to an audience in like 10 minutes. And uh, so I'm not even actually trying it, but I'll give you basically a black box intuition that carries over to the rest of the talk, hopefully. But just very quickly, because not everyone might, might actually know what quantum theory is. Some people think it's rocket science. I think it took my boyfriend probably eight years to figure out it's not like relativity theory or something like that. Quantum theory is a framework. It's basically a mathematical framework. It was developed um, in the early parts of like the last century. And what this graph basically says is that in 1932, this thing was developed. So all the axioms of quantum theory were done. And now in the last hundred years, we're literally just busy milking it, busy like applying it. So it's literally from mathematical theory to applications. And um, this is basically what it is. And I will go through like all these axioms now in the next 30 minutes. No, I'm obviously not doing this. <laughs> but um, base, so maybe if people are in the field, they will uh, probably say, OK, maybe in the third line there's a mistake or something like that. But I think that you can formulate quantum theory literally in those axioms. And they are very heavily based on linear algebra. It takes a while to get used to things. But it's all about like describing a system with a state vector that lives in some kind of Hilbert space, and then how you get actually like predictions of measurement outcomes from all these mathematical apparatus. So we won't go into this. I just want you to see this. So this is now the intuition I want to build with you. And let's spend a little bit of time on that. And for like maybe two or three minutes, I'll open the black box just to show like what's actually going on inside, and then I'll close it again, and then we use this thing. 
So when I speak about a quantum computer, think about a system where something happens inside, and it's a physical system. And now what we pack inside there, and this is also just a, a bit of a lame like analogy, is some quantum system that can be in two different states. And if you want to, think of it as an atom that can be in an excited state or in a ground state, and it's not too far from reality because while quantum computers are based on lots of different technologies, so superconducting qubits, whatever, like I do, or we do in our, uh, in our company, we do like photonic qubit, no, qubits, and actually something that's even more complicated, like cumoids. But however, there's actually something called an iron trap quantum computer where you actually have ions that are in two different states and this implements like basically like something like the basic unit of this quantum computer. So think of like a quantum system that can have two states and for example we now put four of those systems into our computer. So this would be an equi equivalent of four bits in a computer. Oh by the way so one of well quantum computers nowadays have of the order of like 5, 10, 20 bits or qubits. So this is actually the order of magnitude that we're, we're talking about today in technology. Um, and now a second thing that comes into this intuition or into this cartoon is like a couple of parameters. And again, this can be like physically very, very different things. For example, think about you have a laser, a pulsed laser that kind of excites these atoms. So this is basically your control unit that you can tune. And it's very important to say that these are really parameters that you in the lab can choose, right? So these are classical parameters. And now the third, oh yeah, basically, uh, you see here the switch because, so the quantum system can obviously now be in a state, so you could, for example, initialize it by setting the second atom into the excited state and another atom into the ground state. Why well, I switched this uh, cartoon now to something in between, as you might have heard that there is something a bit more weirder going on, like things can be in superposition, but this is just a subtlety for now. Okay, third uh, thing that we pack into the box are measurements. So, um, well, there's nothing that happens. So basically all these four subsystems can be, can be measured. So we can actually say, is the system in the state excited or not in the state zero or one? So what actually an experimentalist or what you get out of a quantum computer is basically these bit strings. So you kind of query it and then you never get anything freaky out. So like physics on our like level of measurements is still like very, very simple to understand. What's actually a bit more complicated is in the black box, but so you query your quantum computer and you get bit, bit strings out, which is basically also what happens in a normal computer, right? So there are some like bit string representations of information in this computer. And then, so basically you can do this like a lot of times and then you get a probability distribution. So quantum theory always describes, so this is one big takeaway and uh, probability distributions over measurement outcomes. Um, and so now like using a bit the, or misusing a bit the language of, of machine learning, this means, so if you interpret now the system as a, as a computer, this means you have, and you interpret basically these like, changing these parameters and doing these physical manipulations of these objects, you interpret this as your algorithm. You have different ways to run this computer. And this is also why there are very different answers when people, when, when you ask me a question, is a quantum computer better for this problem or not? There's very different ways you can run this machine. And are actually, or in quantum machine learning, all these ways are used. So the answer to almost any question always like depends on how you want to run it. Maybe we can call one of these ways as a generative machine. So a quantum computer is always a sample. Every quantum computer is always a sampler. It samples from a certain distribution over like outputs. But you can also like interpret it as you actually get like the binary string out. So you could imagine, so basically the, the very early algorithms, or if you open a textbook and you start from scratch, what you very often see is that what they do, the algorithm does something like it outputs a distribution where you make sure that one of the outputs is very, very large, has a very high probability, and that you define as your output. Um, and then you could also, which is a bit crazy, but we also do this in quantum machine learning quite a lot, you could also define actually the probability of one of these events as an outcome. So obviously they have to be a bit careful because to sample all your outputs, you have an exponentially large probability distribution, so often this is a bit difficult to get. But what you could do, for example, is you just take qubit A here, or system A, and you just, uh, the output of my algorithm is the probability that this qubit is in state one. So this is a continuous number. Okay, let me open this black box a bit. And uh, so this is my, my favorite or standard example to do this because it's a bit interactive and I think you can all do it. I want to compare basically um, a classical probability distribution evolution with a quantum one and just want to show you that there are operations that are a bit strange like to like the way that we think about probabilities. So think you have a, a coin. And now um, first you, you prepare your system to be in, in state heads. 
and now you just like toss it and it's an unbiased coin, you would have the probability of 50-50 that is in either state. Now what happens if you toss the coin again in exactly the same fashion? What's your probability distribution like? 50-50, yeah, I guess, unless something strange happens. Okay, and now let's compare this to a quantum system. Something else can happen, and this is a bit of a jump, obviously, because I'm now choosing the evolution with which I compare the coin, but there's a very standard like evolution, which is called sometimes the Hadamard gate, which like uh, kind of like some of you have heard of it. it. It brings qubits into superposition or something, which is very, very similar to what a coin does. When you do that and you kind of like do the step one, so you prepare your system so that the coin or your qubit is in this one state, in state A, whatever that means. And now you apply this operation of which, you know, I won't tell you more about, but it's very similar to a coin flip. You will actually, if you measure at this state, you will find both uh, possibilities to be 50-50 chance. But if you hadn't measured and now you do the same thing again, you find your system again to have a probability one of, of being like in the initial state. And this is something that's very, very strange like to argue. And now also obviously physicists found that whole thing very strange. And have, so this theory that was devised like in the, in the early like 20th century was basically finding that you can describe these quantum states not with probabilities that are like propagating or that are de like kind of like you're manipulating them, they like change over time, but with something called amplitudes. And amplitudes are something very similar to probabilities, but they're complex numbers. So um, basically, if I would now describe this quantum coin, I would never like use probabilities in the first place. This is what the experimentator like in the lab or something measures. But I would actually use like a state vector that contains like two amplitudes. And they can also be negative, these amplitudes. So, and this is the basic like mechanism of interference. These two values can actually cancel each other out just by the minus sign that you see here. And how do you get from amplitudes to probabilities? You just take the absolute square of them. So the whole thing that's in this black box is basically, you can imagine it to be a giant, not a probability distribution, but a giant amplitude vector that kind of evolves over time and like these different amplitudes can interfere with, with each other, the minus signs can like, cancel things out. And in the end you measure again and you get a certain probability distribution. That's quantum computing in a nutshell. Uh, unless you, you so unless you work for Xanadu, then you have infinite dimensional qubits, which is an absolute nightmare. But yeah, I won't go into that. Okay. And then the last thing I want to say about quantum computers, uh, also because maybe a bit more exotic for some of you, they are actually here. So you can program your own quantum computer in the cloud. Does anyone know of the quantum, uh, the IBM quantum experience? Most of you probably have. Ha has anyone tried to play around with it? Okay, it's quite cool, right? <laughs> yeah. This is, IBM has really done something beautiful for the world there because, um, yeah, it's just so much fun to, to just, so basically, uh, IBM was, was spearheading it, but many companies have actually like followed suit that they have access, cloud access to like a little chip in their lab that has like five qubits. They had access to a chip that had 20 qubits as well, but I think they took that down uh, because it was really, really noisy. So that you here in South Africa, you can just generate a key, like log in there and actually like work on their quantum computer and define algorithms. And they have a little like nice GUI where you can actually like define your own algorithm and like play around with it. And what you see in the end is often like literally just these probability distributions. That should be your output actually. So try that again. But um, what the slides actually wants to, say, wants to tell you is, so the whole field of quantum computing was really like comfortable for many years because it was, it started in the 1990s and it was very theoretical because you didn't have any hardware, it was very difficult to simulate. So everything was, was theoretical. So it was just proofs of upper bounds and, and, and all that stuff. And also the algorithms people devised were like, if I had a perfect quantum good, what could happen, right? So some of you might have heard of Shaw's algorithm, Grover's algorithm. There are lots of results from that field. Um, and it's very difficult to say actually are quantum computers better because the exponential speed ups that we have are often um, about algorithms where we don't know what's the complexity of the classical algorithm. So that's true for Shaw's algorithm that does this RSA encryption cracking and everything, which is why quantum computing probably happened because I think the first big funder was NSA because they said, okay, if in 30 years time you can build this thing and it can crack what information we're trying to do here, we want to be the one who build it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so all these algorithms were there, everyone was like happy. And now these machines started to be around. So you see, I didn't change the, the, the year here, but like, let's say since like three, four years, like it's getting really serious that people, also, and I remember like during my PhD, the first year I thought like, this is, 
not happening, you know? And then all of a sudden I had to really change my mind and think like, oh gosh, this stuff is actually here. What you see is IBM's like really beautiful quantum computer. This is D-Wave, which had a lot of controversy because it's a special purpose quantum computer and they were the first one like going commercial and scientists sometimes don't like that very much. And then, yeah, everyone was a bit pissed off. And this is kind of a system that, that we would build like in the company where I'm working is more photonic chips. Okay, but all these questions now like turn around the whole field and everyone's like asking, what can these devices actually do? They have high errors. They are more like physical experiments almost. What can we do with that? And then people thought, hey, maybe machine learning. Why? Because machine learning kind of, you're not so like much caring for errors because your data is any anyways, like has a lot of errors. And there's a lot of cash in machine learning. So we can actually take this cash and build the quantum computers. <laughs> so this is the reason why quantum machine learning is uh, all of a sudden like everywhere in, in quantum computing, basically. Everyone speaks about it. It means a lot of different things. So even there, it's difficult to say like A or B. Yeah. Uh-oh. Um, you spoke about um, that quantum computers essentially uh, the output of probab a probability distribution. Does that mean that it's possible that given some sort of like addition operation that you can get a wrong answer possibly? That you can get the wrong answer since, in terms since of like yeah. the, the, the if I'm not mistaken, mm. the qubits that are it's like a, there's a lot of like there's a lot of bits being emitted, the zeros and ones, and each of them have a probability distribution. So if you had to perform some sort of like complex operation mm. on these processes, yeah, would is there a possibility that given that you have to sample from this distribution that you might get the wrong oh, answer? Oh, I see. Yeah, so, so that depends. Again, yeah, this depends on how you run this quantum computer. So you were probably talking about this binary where if you actually want this one answer to it, yeah. then you will always have a non-zero. If you have a non-zero probability somewhere else, you have to like just the standard result is just if, if, your, if your probability of your right answer is over above a certain threshold, you just do a couple of experiments and then you will know what was your, your best answer. So very few samples can give you the right answer under certain guarantees. Okay. So that shouldn't be a problem, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, actually this is just to show you, so I don't know, I still don't know exactly what Gartner is, but they do these hype cycles that you all know. <laughs> I just wanted to show you that we are also relevant because machine learning and deep learning is just about to fall down the curve. And we are still climbing here, <laughs> which is cool, obviously. No, I don't know. So I'm showing this just to show you that industry is somehow caring about this. And it's strange for all these people who have been like in these offices, like thinking up their theories, all of a sudden to be actually in the center of some attention. And uh, one second, yeah. And, and just what I want to say about this, all of a sudden a lot of money comes in, a lot of pressures out there, and this like very much influences the research landscape at the moment. So, yeah. So. Um, all right, this is actually just, or reply to the previous question um classical computers can make mistakes too um and and they do we just kind of forgot because we got really really good at making them reliable i mean if you're doing kind of big computations people will still sort of use error correcting code ram and th things like that and or maybe one day quantum computing will get there too that's actually a very good point i won't touch upon this but like error correction is basically that thing that well, kind of like is still in the way of these quantum computers that can basically like solve all these algorithms that people have so thought up. So these devices here are not error corrected. And unfortunately, quantum theory has a no cloning theorem. So that means if you have a qubit in one state, you can't just clone it into the other qubit. So error correction, how you do it classically is completely not available to us. So this is what's really, really hard. And this is also like a theoretical scaling issue at the moment. But there are error correcting codes that just need a lot of qubits. So that's the problem. There's a lot of machine learning used to devise these error correcting methods, actually. And that's a very, quite an ex um, interesting and expanding field as well. Okay. And just also to convince you that we're relevant uh, is like all the companies do it. And I think I forgot a lot of them. Amira said like even Goldman Sachs are on there. So all of these companies have at least like some professional who is like a full-time quantum computing researcher according to well, their standards. And actually Google, Intel, yeah, IBM, Microsoft are the big, big groups that have actually big, big labs now in, in quantum computing. Okay, so much for like, okay, we are important. So what I want you to just like know about this now. So quantum computers map a set of control parameters to samples from a probability distribution. All quantum computers do exactly that. Um, and so this map may be classically inefficient to reproduce. So there's a new dynamics going on that maybe 
the machines you guys or we all use can't really reproduce. But to pin this down is very, very difficult and there are thousands of results, but um, it's not as easy as just saying, okay, this thing is what people can't do like otherwise. Otherwise we would be all done. We would just use this, have this as a resource and then build an algorithm based on this and would just crack all the classical computers. Yeah, and that these quantum computers are there at the moment. Okay, now yes, quantum machine learning. Uh, I'll also only like give a bit of an overview and then I want to dive into like one topic, which is I hope quite easy to understand with this intuition that I gave you now. So quantum machining also means many things. There's a very interesting uh, field or like a small field of actually thinking about what uh, learning theory means in a quantum context, but this is also like very, very theory based. One of the outputs, for example, for sample complexity is that a quantum computer can never um, learn with uh, exponentially fewer samples. So this is, for example, already a result that's proven. And everyone in quantum computers is like, no, now we have to throw it all away. And I, I said to you like a couple of days ago, I thought like, maybe a quadratic speedup would also not be so bad in learning theory, right? But no one is ever interested in quadratic speedups in quantum computing for some reason. So it has to be exponential otherwise, yeah. Okay, now um, there's a, a big and growing research field of using, let me actually start here, actually using machine learning to build quantum computers. So this is, for example, for error correction and stuff like that. Machine learning seems to be very, very interesting, especially reinforcement learning strategies, because they're very close to control theory or people do anyways. Then there's, so this is one of my favorite fields, which I would like to go in if I had time. It's um, this idea of, so quantum, well, physicists have actually started to, you know that like lots of physicists have influenced machine learning over time. I mean, Hopfield networks, you know, like also like backpropagation, there were a lot of people, like a lot of physicists involved in there. And even nowadays we have a lot of theories and a lot of like construction and methods in physics and especially in quantum physics that could be interesting for machine learning. I just sketched this very briefly. There's something called tensor networks. So basically quantum systems, I told you like they are described by these like big vectors that are something like probabilities. So these are exponentially large spaces. And to describe these systems, we like had obviously like a lot of trouble. How can you like describe a system if you never can write down even the state in which it lives? So like a lot of very smart people have devised methods to kind of like parameterize these states very smartly and have a lot of theories on in which cases this works and not. And they've found a very good parameterization method, which seems to be very close to physical correlations that you really like get in nature. And these tensor networks have now been started to use like, you know, it's, it's very closely connected to renormalization group and stuff like that to actually, for example, parameterize the layers of neural networks, like to enter, to enter machine learning in that sense. And I think there's a lot that will come from this space as well. And I'm also, I start thinking it's nice if machine learning gets a couple more physicists just to have a bit more like theory guided research, a bit more toy models and a bit less like tables of results that, that you know, is only that. Okay. What I'm interested in most of the time is uh, basically data mining with quantum devices, which you probably thought was quantum machine learning in the first place. Maybe this is the, the small, the tight definition that some people use. And there again are two different spheres. And I think the one on the right here, coherent algorithms is more, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, people have basically come from this like really like this, this stiff tradition of quantum computing to do everything theoretically and have again said like, oh, there's, for example, matrix inversion in some algorithms. Let's try to exponentially speed this up on a quantum computer. So exactly always the same routes, that, the same techniques that we already had. We just use it and write a paper where machine learning is on top. And then it sells like really a lot better. And, but so these algorithms are really interesting. So it's still very interesting, but it's stuff that can only be like maybe done 20, 30 years down the line. And the second problem with that, it, so there was a bit of a scandal in the field because uh, recently, maybe a year ago, like an 18-year-old <laughs> young woman, um, I think from Caltech, Stanford, I always forget, even Tang came and dequantized all the algorithms, so it showed that most of these algorithms actually can be done classically if you just sample a bit more smartly. And now everyone is actually quite uh, interested in that and thinking maybe we can actually give you better machine learning algorithms just from having thought about quantum computing and coming back to classical sampling algorithms, but we see what, what happens there. So that's work ongoing. I'm interested in hybrid algorithms, and they are basically thinking about these near-term devices. What can we use them for? We can, we can do of the order of 100 elementary gates at the moment on these sets. Imagine you could just do like 50 AND gates and 30 like OR gates. What would you do in machine learning with that? That's our question at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, and hybrid means you make everything that's difficult, you put on a classical computer, but just you give it a little, you have basically a car where every part is classical and a little bit part of the engine is quantum 
just to make it different. And the big <laughs> question is now, what is different? The big, actually, my personal question at the moment is, how can you even study these systems? We can't simulate them because the moment you scale, you can't simulate it. That's the idea of quantum computing, right? You can't really like do theory because it's machine learning. You don't know the classical theory very well. So what do you do there? So basically, even how do we, as scientists, grab this problem is, is very difficult to understand. Okay, and then also like, um, they're also like different, some people look at training, for example, drawing samples from a quantum computer to train, for example, um, Boltzmann machines. That was a big, I don't know, when you go to a quantum machine in conference, everyone talks about Boltzmann machines and they always say, well, the state of the art in classical Boltzmann machines is this and that. And then you go to a <laughs> classical machine in conference, no one does Boltzmann machines, but anyways. But again, the, I'm, I'm, I will now talk about inference. So basically, how do you um, get your model on a quantum computer on a very small one at that? Is so that kind of fine for now? Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, and then variation circuits um, is a name for, for like one of these ideas, and I'll be a bit superficial about this, but yeah, ask me afterwards if you have questions. This is, by the way, the way you write quantum circuits. So this is kind of your systems that we had, the qubits before. This is the manipulation with the parameters you do. The parameters are called theta, so just that you'd keep track on what you're doing, and these are the measurements. And variation circuits are basically just like trainable quantum algorithms. And this idea sounds really stupid, but or it sounds very small, but it, it has kind of a long tradition also coming from quantum chemistry, and there's, there's more to it than only that. But however, the long and short of it is that you actually like, you throw your measurement results into cost function, and then use a classical computer to update your measurement results. So that's a variation circuit. Um, and now in quantum machine learning, or these are the ideas from the last couple of years, what happens actually if I just use my quantum device that works in this way as a classifier? So I, I encode some input into the device and then I, I use the measurement results and use them as an output. Um, I don't know if, if this makes any sense to you, but, but basically you would have one set of operations that you tune, for example, the one laser pulse, you exactly tune by 0.2 if 0.2 is your data input, basically. So one set of, of operations you, you feed in your data point to encode it in your quantum system, and then the other part of the circuit is like your trainable parameters. And then you measure, for example, only one qubit here. This is like an, an expectation value of, an, of a sigma z operator, which is basically just measuring is the qubit in state one or zero. So it's a complicated way to say something. So basically, our machine learning model is the quantum device. What does the device do? What hypothesis classes does, does this encode? If we have a very, very small circuit, can it actually learn gates? Can it learn like data sets? Does quant do quantum systems actually like encode different correlations than classical neural networks, for example? All these questions are like just starting. Um, you can also use it as part of a neural network. Let's skip over this. There was some work that was actually the, that what sparked this article that I showed you in the first slide is like you can embed data into a quantum state, which is very similar to a feature map. What feature maps does this give rise to? So you can throw the whole thing in a kernel machine. This has been demonstrated on the IBM device using two qubits. <laughs> So your future space is four dimensional. So yeah, okay, so far away from anything. Um, and then last thing to say is a lot of work now goes into thinking what kind of circuits, so what kind of quantum algorithms, what operations do we use to do interesting things? Um, yeah, so that's, there's lots of, lots of like papers at the moment coming up there. And lastly, I have five minutes, 10 minutes? Yeah, or five, I can, five I can minutes. okay, I can stop at any time, so yeah. Sorry, quick question. I saw mm -hmm. a word that I didn't recognize. Uh, un ansatz? Uh? Oh, in this context, it means um, a basically, a, oh gosh, this is actually a template for a circuit that you can feed in and then you start um, training the parameters in a certain way. So basically, like when I showed you before this like black box, this U, this was like some kind of like algorithm that happened. Um, basically, how do I break it down into smaller operations that are all parameterized in some way? So basically, basically, it's the, the it's skeleton. A framework. Of the, huh? It's a framework, a set framework. Yeah, yeah. but it's basically the skeleton of the algorithm yeah. that you then tune. Yeah. And then lastly, um, also a bit quick and, and summarized, but come to me if, it, if you want to learn more about it. What I'm thinking a lot, or last year I thought a lot about is how do you get gradients out of a quantum computer? So now you have this model, how can you train it? We know we can't do something like backpropagation because we can't really like look into this like black box, what's a quantum computer. But it turns out there's something very elegant that you can do. And then the last slide is we built a software framework for this where you can actually train, for example, IBM's five qubit device and start like using these gradients. Just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, 
So our way of thinking about this is if we now have these hybrid algorithms, we might actually have mix, mixing between classical computing and quantum computing. So we think about this as nodes in the network that come together. And this quantum computing will be like one of these circuits with one ansatz would be like, for example, to put a G gate here and this gate here and whatever. So, but now you have a cost function at the end and now you want to find the gradient of that cost function. How do you do it? Um, so without going into the mathematical details, but somehow your gradient will depend on the gradient of the circuit, right? Or of the circuit output. You could do numerical optimization or black box optimization. Actually, I want to speak to this with Chris like after, so maybe I have some ideas um, how to do that. And people on small scales do this at the moment, but we know that it doesn't scale very well, if I may say that. So maybe that's not a good idea when it goes bigger. There are some theoretical results that gradients also kill black box optimization there, but I don't have them cited here. You could do automatic differentiation, but only if you like simulate your classical device and there's um, your quantum device. So, and there's, um, for example, at Xanadu, we have a software framework to simulate our quantum computer. And one of the backends is completely coded in TensorFlow. So basically you can automatically differentiate through your quantum simulation, but this is only for theory, obviously. And now lastly, there is now a method to compute analytic gradients of these quantum devices. And it turns out that the rule to do it is unbelievably simple if you have a certain type of gate, but this type of gate is almost what almost everyone uses. And this is probably too small to see, but um, the rule works like this. You run exactly your quantum circuit, but the parameter you want, you shift it by a certain amount S, which is fixed and given by theory, and it looks a bit different for every architecture, but we know what it is. And you subtract the, exactly the same result of your circuit if you just like subtract the S. And when you see, this looks exactly like the finite differences rule, but for a macroscopic shift S. We have no clue why this is the case. This has something to do with unitary groups and like the algebra that we're living in, but um, it's a very beautiful rule. So now that means if you have a quantum device, you just run it twice, you change one parameter once, and you can update that parameter because the shift is your gradient. That's pretty cool. We thought it was so cool, so we coded a software framework around it, and this is some cheap advertisement, but I think, so this is the first software product that I've ever proud of because it's really nice and I force all my students to work in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Okay, so if you want to check it out, it's uh, on pennylane.ai. And now uh, a couple of maybe interesting things about this, you will see that, so it's basically an interface between machine learning frameworks, classical machine learning frameworks and the quantum computers. And here you see plugins are available for different quantum computers and quantum software frameworks. But you also see the interface is available to PyTorch, NumPy and TensorFlow. So basically, when you want to integrate into PyTorch, you actually just have to define what gradients of your model actually produces. And we did that, and so now you can do a PyTorch optimization and just like put a little quantum device somewhere and see what happens. It's very slow. Training is unbelievably slow. <laughs> We're working on that. <laughs> but it's a theory, I mean, it's a theoretical problem in this sense. And so just to show you, this is my last slide, just to show you a bit of code. So literally what happens in your code, so it's all in Python, so physicists always code in Python, I don't know, but it's very convenient, I don't know. And you know, it's just an, an interface anyways. Um, so basically, you, you can define in one line your quantum device, so here D4Q, but you could also say IBM Q, whatever, and how many qubits you want, and then you define like basically just a function, which is your circuit, and in that you have a certain type of operation, which is like what gates you use or what architecture you use. And then you can just like, in normal computation, define a cost function, where you, the output of the circuit, you add it, or you do whatever you want with it, so there's the classical part of the computation. And then you can use uh, gradient optimizers. So obviously you can also use TensorFlows or, or um, um, PyTorch's optimizers here, but like you just, we have also some like shipped in there. And then you can start like training these circuits. And we're currently like thinking, what, what does that actually mean? What, what happens in this case? Okay, and that's it. If you want, join us. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much for the talk. It's quite interesting. I just wanted to ask, um, with respect to the hardware. I mean, where is where are you guys with respect to the hardware? And like, what are the uh, the challenges you're facing and pushing that frontier yeah. forward? Yeah, it's just a noise. It's just we have a physical experiment that's that has very noisy results, and to, to reduce them to a level. Um, at the moment that you can actually do computations with, even with the small devices is, is a problem. But in the sense of scaling them up, a lot of problems are to make uh, these units communicate with one another. So basically, we want two things. You want to have a sweet spot. You, want, you have a quantum system, you're not allowed to touch it. You have to have it as isolated as you can, but you want to manipulate them to like these things to communicate with them. So basically control 
and uh, you know, quantum coherence are things that are separate and you have to kind of bring them together. Mm. What do they look like? <laughs> How big are they? <laughs> are they so like the, in giant rooms, like back in the day? D wave is like this. So this is this black box that they built. Mm -hmm. So they look very similar. So those ones look very similar to computers in the 40s. So sometimes you can really <laughs> yeah. put these pictures. And we have, honestly, in quantum computing, we have very similar situations like in the 40s. Like we're looking for applications. We're not sure what comes up. <laughs> I heard that normal computers, gaming was the applications that pushed them to be commercialized, but it only came like 30 years later or something. But they really look like that. And then often, so it depends very much on your hardware. So sometimes you've got like these, these fridges like that cool things down to like almost zero Kelvin. And then you kind of like have like some, some kind of cryosters. How do you call them, Francesco? I'm not even sure. What we're building are little chips. They're nanophotonics. So it's literally a chip that's as small as like a little part of your fingernail. And then you try to couple light in and light comes out and the quantum computation happens in there. It's so cool. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> Actually, I think IBM spent a lot of time and money to redesign the outside of their current quantum computer. To, there was a big launch and it looks like a spaceship. It was really cool, but I don't, I'm not too sure if it makes the inside better, but yeah, they're working on it. Yeah. Thanks, Maria. Um, in the letter you wrote to Nature that I just briefly read and like, I didn't quite follow, um, it seemed like <laughs> one of the things was about almost like a kernel trick. Like yeah. you were saying, okay, you can map this data into some high dimension, like some quantum states, do classification in there. Um, and so do you feel like that is one of like, in, in a, like for all the advantages and cons for quantum computing, do you feel like that more like kernel trick approach is like where like the future will be or not yeah. so important? So I'm super biased because that's one of my favorite ideas. So this and, is- And my master's thesis. <laughs> Oh, God. No, it's one of my favorite ideas. I think it has a lot of potential. But so what people have shown, I mean, this is super simple to do because everything that quantum theory already does, and when you look at kernel theory, they are so similar. Quantum theory is working with Hilbert spaces, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces and kernel theory. It's this idea of feature mapping something into a big space, computing implicitly in that big space, and then getting something out of it. Similarities, there's so much that's, that's similar. And um, so this is why it's very elegant. But however, no one has yet shown a quantum kernel that, that's interesting. And that's actually very difficult because even classical kernels, why is the Gaussian kernel so good? What, which ones are good? Which ones are, why does even the sin, sinus kernel, I don't know how you call them, cosine kernel actually work? It's very tricky to find that. But just on that note, like most people focus on neural networks because, because it's a very trendy topic. But quantum theory and neural network, the mathematical description of neural networks is very different. So it's a pain to actually try to unite them, but it sounds so cool, so that's why. Probably do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks, Maria. Tea break.